Welcome to Think Tech Asia. I'm your host, Phil Sharp, President of Sharp Research and Translation. My guest today is uh, Mr. Richard Hornick. Uh, he is a former executive editor of Asia Week and, uh, magazine and also was bureau chief for Time magazine in Hong Kong and Beijing. He's written for all kinds of publications, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and also written for foreign affairs. Our, our topic today is Hong Kong in the wake of the Umbrella Movement. Welcome to Think Tech Asia. Thank you very much. Wow, Hong Kong, uh, exciting place. Uh, um, now, your, your experience with Hong Kong goes way back, and you, you spent a significant period of time there, both during the colonial days, and mm -hmm. uh, if I recall correctly, in the post-colonial mm -hmm. days. Right. So how would you compare colonial Hong Kong with you know, Hong Kong as an SAR, especially in this Yeah, I, and yeah, for, superficially, I don't think you see much difference. Um, it's run by the same civil service, more or less. So the British put in two really, or three really important things. They put in a great legal system, which is more or less intact. They did some amazing civil engineering, which has made it possible to build that city, especially on Hong Kong Island, up and down all those hillsides without them sort of sliding away in these uh, massive brainstorms. They mm. And they also uh, created a very, very effective, as you might imagine, uh, civil service um, and, a, and, a, and a good police force. And so most of that was left intact, um, and, and it remains intact. Uh, it's uh, smaller things. I, one, of the, one of the things I used to joke about was that after the British left, the atmosphere in Hong Kong became better in some ways, because there were a lot of uh, uh, British uh, uh, workers in Hong Kong, uh, because they could get working papers there when other foreigners couldn't. And so if you wanted to hire expats, you hired these people first. And they weren't very qualified, and they were mostly, many of them, out for a a good time. They were called Jardine Johnnies. Uh, um, Jardine, and, I never heard that term um, before. <laughs> and there was another expression, filth, failed in London, try Hong Kong. I've heard uh, that one. Yeah. Um, so, and they were not often pleasant people, and they were especially uh, often unpleasant to locals, uh, mm. you know, cab drivers and that sort of stuff. And so I, when the first time I went back afterwards, I just, that's you know, purely anecdotal, but it just seemed to me that it was a slightly better relationship between the uh, the foreigners and the, and the Chinese. Mm. That, those, those sorts of British expats are sort of living off the fat of the colonial empire. Right. Yeah, sure. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it seems a lot of countries that had colonies had that type of person mm -hmm. that they sure. didn't want to have in the metropolitan power and were happy to farm out to the colonies. Sure. They had to, you know, that's, you had to do, find these people somewhere, right? <laughs> Well, you know, could it be said that the that the structure of um, the administrative structure of Hong Kong today is very similar to what it was during colonial period? Absolutely. And in fact, you could argue that there's far more democracy now than there was for the vast uh, majority of the time under the British. The British only very belatedly introduced uh, uh, open elections uh, in in Hong Kong. It was well into the 80s before anything any serious democratic movement came on. And this is something that the Chinese sort of picked up on, and they said, well, wait a second, you, you only introduce democracy when you're going to hand it over to us? Mm. No, no, it was run by a, a governor appointed by the queen, um, and the civil, top civil servants were, uh, you know, reported to him, and uh, there was an executive council and a legislative council, but those weren't, it wasn't a, a free, uh, uh, they weren't free and open elections, they were, you know, constituencies and that sort of mm. technical constituencies. So, um, yeah, no, it's uh, it's one of the things that I, I, I mentioned uh, in my talk at the China seminar mm -hmm. the other day is it, it's not so much about democracy, it's about competency and accountability. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, that's my view of the umbrella movement. It's, yes, the students, of course, are want democracy and the people theoretically want it, but if the government were more competent, um, I don't think the outpouring would have been quite as large. Well, okay. Is it fair to say that the British colonial government was more competent than, than the current one? Uh, off and on. So they had some pretty bad governors too. Uh, but then they had some good ones. And uh, I don't think you can say that there has been a good chief executive yet 
in the post-97. I remember your comment the other day when you, when you were explaining, and I was in complete agreement with you. But how about British governors? Now, you talked about Chris Patton, mm -hmm. and it seemed to me you had a pretty upbeat view of yeah. him. Um, there was one, oh, I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce his name correctly, Mary McElhose. Oh, Ma McElhose. McElhose. Yeah, he was a good one. Um, David Wilson was not, a, not bad. Um, you know, they were mixed. Mm -hmm. um, but they were also benefited from a point, uh, especially starting in the, in the mid-70s, when China opened up. And mm -hmm. so the Hong Kong uh, economy really exploded at that point. Um, and, and, you know, a rising tide uh, lifts all boats. So when, you, know, you don't have to be so competent when, when things are going well. You need, to, you need that level of expertise more when you've got to figure out what your next step is. Hong Kong's economy has always been um, integrated with the mainlands, hasn't it? Pretty much. I mean, although less so, obviously, during you know the Cultural Revolution in that period. Mm -hmm. But it, yeah, it always was sort of an entrepot. That's how you got into the country. And certainly, you know, Hong Kong, from its beginnings as a British uh, treaty port in uh, you know 1849 or whatever it was, in the wake of the Opium War, you know, that's. It's, uh, that's where all the compradors were. It was yes, right. uh, yeah. It was, right. but it was kind of middleman trading. It wasn't uh, as much uh, manufacturing during the Vietnam War uh, and uh, around that era. A lot of manufacturing developed in Hong Kong, which mm -hmm. had nothing to do with China. So there was lots of. Uh, I'm sure you were there, and you've seen you know, all right. those big, big factories, right. uh, even in, on Hong Kong Island, out on the western end of right. Hong Kong Island. Uh, all of which have moved to Shenzhen. Uh, all of which have moved to Shenzhen. Many of which have moved to Shenzhen. Uh -huh. And, you know, now they're being turned into lofts. So <laughs> everybody wants lofts these days. Right, right. Well, um... Actually, uh, and now they've moved well beyond Shenzhen. And now they're, you know, Shenzhen is, um, is, is become too expensive for that sort of stuff. So mm -hmm. a lot of this uh, fabric, textile stuff, work is now being done in the, in the inner parts of Guangdong province, even up in, in Shen, uh, Sichuan and places like that. Mm. It's really moved fast. And wow, the government is pushing it. The, the government is pushing it because they, um, they, they've got to create wealth and jobs in, in the inland. The, the real problem with, with China faces and in income distribution is that all the people along the coast are doing great, and all the people who live inland are not doing great. That's This Gini coefficient is right. you know, quite, right. it's, it's about it's about the difference between uh, uh, Fu Fujian and, uh, and Sichuan. Mm. Uh, so, so they're really making an effort to do that, and that's why they do all of these roads and railroads. That's, you know, part of that is to make it more possible to, to, to push production back into the hinterland. Now, you, you were saying something earlier that I'd like to get back to because I think it's an important point. You were saying in many ways, today's Hong Kong, as a, uh, Hong Kong as a special administrative region of the People's Republic of China, is more democratic than it was as a British Crown colony. Could you elaborate on that? Sure. I mean, there were no elections at all uh, okay. in, in Hong Kong up until, and I, you know, I'd have to check this out, but certainly not before the 70s. Okay. Um, and they have elections now. Right. They have, you know, they have a LegCo, right. uh, Legislative Council. Um, it's a kind of weird uh, thing where it's a mix of direct uh, constituencies, so where you live, and uh, what they call professional constituencies. Right. So uh, the accountants have a representative, right. and lawyers have a representative. Right. Very strange. But you know, American democracy was pretty strange initially as well. Right. I mean, you had to be a landowner to, to vote. Uh, the Senate wasn't directly elected until the late 19th century. It was all stitched up in the, in the so anyway. It's, so it's it's gone through uh, through some some changes, and I would argue that um, that at this point there is it's at least as democratic as it was when the British turned it over. And um, you often hear comments that um, in today's Hong Kong there's some um, self censorship mm -hmm. at, at the media, because that's an area where you're mm -hmm. quite familiar with. There's been some talk in the past that uh, the owner of the South China Post, Robert, of, yeah, uh, was uh, put a pretty tight control on articles about mm -hmm. China. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure he owns the South China Post. The, uh, I, I, at the last state. report he did, I, he, he, his daughter has been uh, running it, but I think, there, yeah, that still has an effect. No, no, there are 
And you know, the South China Morning Post is, is not an important newspaper in Hong Kong mm -hmm. because it's in English. Mm -hmm. The vast mm -hmm. majority of, of Hong Kong's seven million people, mm -hmm. you know, they may speak some English, but they're not going to read their daily newspaper. In English. Right. They read it in, in Chinese. Right. And, uh, and it's, the, it's the big Chinese dailies that have started to pull their punches. They were much more aggressive maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, and there's a lot of pressure put on businessmen to mm -hmm. rein them in. And then, of course, you know, this guy, Jimmy Lai, uh, who uh, created the Apple Daily, who was, he, Jimmy was, a, as, as you probably know, was a, a, a clothing magnet. He started Giordano Shops, which uh, did very, very well. He made a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Then he went into media. And uh, he, his home and office and, a, and some other place were firebombed uh, just, just yesterday. yesterday. Yeah. No. So, um, so yeah, there's a, there's, there's a lot of, uh, of uh, punch pull, pulling, if you will. Oh, uh, now, what's your theory? Who's responsible for this uh, firebombing? What's oh, your best guess? Or you know, maybe I, I, you have some I, insight I, that you can No, to but share as I, I mean, I do like, you know, my old boss, uh, Norm Perlstein's line about preemptive sycophancy. sycophancy. You know, I think there are people who think that they're doing what Beijing wants, mm. and so that that may be it. It's hard to tell. Organized um, crime? It could be organized crime. It's almost certainly it, it, the perpetrators are almost certainly organized crime. But you know, they who who paid them, uh, you know, who 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 directed them? They're they're for hire. They're you know oh, they don't sure. they're not doing it for ideological reasons. Sure. So um, it's very hard to say. But yeah, you know, but you're absolutely right. The tension is growing. And you know, it's it, there's some very worrisome signs beyond the media. Um, you have uh, two 14-year-old kids who uh, were photographed in the demonstrations. They, you know, social services have gone to their parents and threatened to take them away uh, and put them in foster care because the parents clearly uh, can't control them and uh, you know they're 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 in danger. That's a very very frightening. Uh, that, that is, that's very heavy-handed. That's um, very, very heavy-handed. And, you know, they've put out arrest warrants for something like 30 of the organizers. Mm. Um, it'll be really interesting to see what happens when those cases go to court. And I think that's going to be a real litmus test going forward in, in Hong Kong. Um, I, before we focus all our attention on the umbrella uh, movement, uh, let me ask you this other question, okay? Um, if I understood you correctly the other day at the China seminar, uh, my interpretation was that the legal system is under threat. And of course, the legal system has been one of the, um, lots of people say, well, the, the grandest thing that the mm -hmm. British left behind, mm -hmm. a very competent, mm -hmm. uh, fair mm -hmm. uh, judicial system. Mm -hmm. uh, and clearly, Hong Kong was ruled by law, mm -hmm. or has been, at least up to this point. What's the future for the legal system in Hong Kong? There are a lot of, uh, I, I knew a couple of judges there, um, and even, I'd say, two years ago, they were concerned uh, mm -hmm. that about the, not, not so much about their own uh, independence, but the independence of some of their colleagues. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you talk to people like Martin Lee, mm -hmm. the very famous uh, democracy advocate, but right. also a very famous barrister, mm -hmm. um, he has been warning uh, of, of a uh, diminution in the uh, independence of, 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 of the Hong Kong judiciary. So, um, yeah, I, you know, it's, 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 very, it's going to be very interesting to watch because it is their competitive advantage against the mainland, mm -hmm. almost full stop. Um, you've, you know what's going to happen in the courts. You know you're going to get a fair shake in the courts, uh, no matter who you are. And that is just one of the most important things possible um, in doing business, the, the sanctity of a contract. I, you know, that's a, these are my next question. If the legal system is under threat, what is going to be the impact of that to, you know, Hong Kong's reputation as a, a global financial center? Yeah, well, over time it will, it will dwindle. Um, and, uh, the, you know, I, it, it's, I, I, I'm not going to get, you know, start, you know, as I said, I don't like making predictions. But, but, but I think you have to look at trend lines. And if I were someone who 
wanted the best for Hong Kong. I wanted, or was you know interested in watching Hong Kong. I would pay less attention to the demonstrations and more attention to things like the mm. uh, the, the judicial system. And, and the civil service and what's going on in that field. Okay, well, we'll come back to that. We have to take a break now. Uh, you're watching Think Tech Asia. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is Mr. Richard Hornick. And we've been talking about Hong Kong uh, in the aftermath of the Umbrella Revolution. And we'll be right back. Aloha, I'm Hunter Hevelin, host of Sustainable Hawaii here at Think Tech Hawaii. You can tune in every week on Thursday at 2 p.m to see interviews with sustainability professionals from around the state and even further abroad, learning about activities with water management, food security, waste management, and a whole host of other uh, fascinating opportunities to get engaged with making a greener island. So if you're interested in making the transition from consuming, produ consuming individuals to communities of producers, check us out every Thursday. Aloha. Welcome back to Think Tech Asia. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is Mr. Richard Hornick. We've been talking about Hong Kong. We first talked about Hong Kong during the colonial period and then uh, talked about it uh, in its present status as a special administrative region of the People's Republic of China. Of course, everybody knows there was the Umbrella Movement that just uh, took place um, very recently in Hong Kong. We want to turn our focus uh, to that at this time. Well, what caused it? What's your explanation? When people come to you and say, Rick, what's this umbrella movement all about? What, what, what caused it? What's, what's going on? So uh, in the joint declaration, declaration between the United Kingdom and the People's Republic of China in 1997, they agreed that Hong Kong would be granted an increasing amount of suffrage so that people would more and more be able to elect their own representatives directly. And as I said before, you know, this is in contrast to, you know, that it was more and more than they had under British rule. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the key elements was the um, bringing in of universal suffrage on uh, on the on all elections, and the main one is for chief executive. Was that stipulated universal suffrage? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, it was. You know, there there's some ways you could dance around it, but it's pretty much the. The way that it was originally done was that there were, it's a group of, I think, 1,400 worthies, you know, uh, important, uh, the, the, the good and the great, if you will, um, who uh, made the choice. So uh, a nominating committee would come up with a couple of, uh, of, of, of uh, candidates, and the, but the election itself for chief executive, which is the top job, was, uh, and basically the linear descendant of the governor, Mm -hmm. uh, was to be only, it was only by, voted on by these 1,400 or so. I don't know the exact number, but you know, let's say less than 1,500 people. Mm -hmm. And so the next step was to open that up to everyone. And uh, so in this past summer, uh, Beijing and the Hong Kong government basically said, okay, fine, you're going to get that, but we're still going to nominate these, we're going to control the nomination of these candidates. So Jimmy Lai isn't going to get to run for chief executive. Uh, Martin Lee is not going to get to, right. even Anson Chan, you know, probably, you know, mm -hmm. we will determine who that will be. And then you, the Hong Kong people, you can vote. Well, that's sort of like, you know, the old communist elections, you know, in you know, post-war Europe where you know, they get 99.9% .9 of, of, of the vote, you know, because there was only one person to vote for. That's the way China <laughs> does its elections at the village level, basically. Uh, you know, actually, it, it depends. There, you know, uh, different provinces have taken it to different, um, to different levels. So there's some pretty interesting stuff at the, at the, at the, at the local level. Um, and that's where it should begin. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so, so basically, uh, the people, uh, a lot of the, the dem democracy advocates were upset by this. Um, a small digression, but it's sort of important. Two years ago, the, uh, the government tried to push through a new uh, type of textbook, uh, t a history textbook, teaching how great China is, mm. uh, teaching, for instance, 
the uh, superiority of a single party system as opposed to multiple party democracy and all that sort of stuff. And um, there was an uproar, but um, there was uh, a bunch of, of high school students led by this kid, Joshua Wong, mm -hmm. who at the time I think was 14. Um, they went on a hung hunger strike. And they said, this is, you know, you can't tell us, you know, how we're going to be taught. And uh, the, the current chief executive, C.Y. Lung, who, as I said, is, you know, the, the, the worst in a long series of not so good <laughs> ones, um, did one of the dumbest things a politician uh, ruler could ever do. He said, in no way, shape, or form will we back down. Mm. And two weeks later, he backed down. Mm. And so, um, so you have this cadre of young people, and they've already succeeded. They've made this guy blink once. And so then this comes along, and this, these, these young people decide that this will not stand. And that was the beginning of the Umbrella Revolution. The umbrella thing is just who knows where that came from. You know, it's hot in Hong Kong, as you know. A lot of people are holding umbrellas. Right, 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 right. Um, you know, it's why do you, you know, why was it the saffron revolution or the orange revolution in Ukraine or whatever? So, I, the other day at the China seminar, you were you're saying that <coughs> basically Xi Jinping doesn't understand China's middle class. I mean, I think he understands what I would call the comprador class, the mm -hmm. Li Ka the, mm -hmm. the big tycoons. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, he knows how to handle them. Right. But what did you mean by he doesn't understand the middle class? Well, in Hong Kong, I, I, I wouldn't say he doesn't understand. I'd say he doesn't particularly care. Mm. Um, the, the Hong Kong middle class is getting squeezed. That, sometimes they're called the sandwich class mm -hmm. because they're between the very wealthy and the, and the very poor. And you know, their housing prices have skyrocketed. Many, many of the middle class in Hong Kong are small entrepreneurs who require uh, you know, uh, space for their offices, for their restaurants, for their shops. Those rents have skyrocketed. When I was teaching at the University of Hong Kong uh, a couple of years ago, all of my students were telling me about all the signs in the windows of all the noodle shops and dumpling shops in, the, in that area of, of Hong Kong that were uh, saying they were going out of business mm. because um, a new escalator was being built there, which would be, you know, sort of... So anyway, they were all getting driven out of business. So uh, this goes back to what I was saying before. It, it, the, the people of, of Hong Kong, uh, many of them, are interested in more democracy. But if, if the government, if the, if the chief executives that had been chosen over the last 17 years were any good, mm. I don't think there would have been that, out, that, that same level of outpouring from the sandwich class. You know, 5,000, 6,000 students wouldn't have made the dent in, in Hong Kong's reputation that the hundreds of thousands of people who marched uh, and supported them. You know, sometimes as I was watching the Umbrella Revolution, I, I felt a little bit disappointed in some of the older Hong Kong people. I mean, here we have the students out there, you know, yeah, putting the personal safety into mm -hmm. jeopardy for a better Hong Kong. And then there's the other people on the, on the sidelines sort of complaining about, oh, well, there's creating traffic jams. We can't do this. We can't do that. Um, it, it seems to me, basically, Hong Kong really doesn't care about much except making money. And anything that gets in the way... Oh, I, you know, look, <laughs> any, any society, you'll have people who support and people who... You know, everything I've read tells me, tells me that during the American Revolution, a third of the people were in favor of the revolution. A third mm -hmm. of the people were completely against the revolution, mm -hmm. and a third were up for grabs. <laughs> um, and you know that's why Thomas Paine was so important. Right. You know, who knows? Right. But you know, in Hong Kong, I'd say it was probably about the same. A third of the people supported, strongly supported the uh, Umbrella Revolution. There are seven million people in Hong Kong, so sure. that's a couple of million people. Right. There are you know a few you know, million in the middle, not happy with the way the situation is now, but. You know, don't, they don't particularly like being inconvenienced. And then there are people who make their living by uh, being affiliated with what's, you know, with, with China, with mainland China. Right, so, right. Um, you know, but if you are a taxi driver and you're not making much money, right? Right, right? And all of a sudden you can't go, you can't, you can't drive uh, the routes that make you the money. Right. You're an old lady and, you know, what people forget, you know Hong Kong well, mm -hmm. you know, Central is where mm -hmm. all the doctors are. Right, right. Right? So you can't, you couldn't get there. Right. You know, you're a little old lady and you're frail and, 
and uh, so, uh, you know, the problem with covering these things, and I've covered my share of them, mm -hmm. is that we always make it into this kind of, uh, you know, good versus evil kind of thing. Mm. There's shades within shades within shades. There are people who supported the umbrella movement who, uh, you know, for their own not so great motives. There are people on the other side who would have loved to support it publicly, but they were afraid of what would happen to them uh, politically or, or economically. Uh, you know, walk a mile in their shoes. Um, okay, going forward, these college students who played, Actually, these are, a lot of them were high school students. Don't high school students. <coughs> Okay, going forward, I mean, this is going to be an experience which is going to, you know, have a very deep impact on their life and their mm -hmm. thinking. How is this going to impact Hong Kong in the future as these folks get older and begin to take on, you know, more responsible positions in Hong Kong? I think a lot of them are going to work their way into politics, I'm sure. Oh, I, I actually, I think the fear is that this will create a brain drain. That oh, because yeah. it's not going to end well. They're not mm -hmm. going to change. Mm. Xi Jinping can't afford to back down. Right. Um, uh, he is afraid of you know a whole bunch of things, contagion and right. his own middle class. <clears throat> so the, there's a real concern that what will happen is not unlike what happened after '89, is that you know the best and the brightest will will leave. Um, that's a, that's a trend that Hong Kong turned around, though, isn't it? At the time that it went back to China, lots of people were anxious to get out of Hong Kong, take their money with them, go wherever, Canada, mm -hmm. Australia, New Zealand, wherever they could find a new home. Mm -hmm. And then, as I understand it, that trend changed after a period of time, and people began to go back to Hong Kong. Actually, in many ways, they never left. Okay. What they were really doing was getting themselves a bolt hole. Okay. Um, and if that required investing some money in Canada in order to get a landed immigrant status for your children, <coughs> excuse me, mm -hmm. or, or for the husband, you know, the families, you know, the, half the family would be in Hong Kong and, and the other half would be in Canada or Australia or someplace getting the papers they needed to get everybody out if things turned out badly. Right. Uh, you got to remember, 97 was just uh, eight years after Tiananmen. Right. And, um, uh, you know, I was, I was in Tiananmen up until the day before the massacre. And then I was in Hong Kong the day the massacre occurred, and I covered the big march on, on June 4th, Sunday, mm -hmm. June 4th. And I wrote at the time that it was clear that the people of Hong Kong had finally stared 1997 in the face and were horrified. Mm -hmm. They had seen the, the real possibilities, the, you know, the real downside of Chinese rule. And, and these so, were people, uh, a lot of these people had, or at least their mothers and fathers and grandfathers had left China right. at the time of liberation <coughs> right. in 1949. Right. So they, right. they didn't start off with real positive <laughs> attitudes not, for not China anyway. Not just in 49. These are people who in the 50s and 60s were, uh, I forget when they stopped it, but I think it was in the 70s that, you know, it's sort of like uh, we have with Cubans. Mm -hmm. If you, if a Chinese got his or her foot on Hong Kong soil, they were, they could stay. No one was sent back. Mm. I think that changed in the late 70s. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't so important then. This was, you know, after the end of the Cultural Revolution. So, but yes, absolutely, the DNA of, of the Hong Kong people is to be very, very suspicious of, 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 the, of the political intent uh, of the people in Beijing. Let's come back to this. We need to take another break right now. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Uh, you're watching Think Tech Asia. Our guest today is Mr. Richard Hornick, and we have been talking about Hong Kong. And we will return in just a minute, so stay with us. Aloha. My name is Paul Jackson, better known as PJ, and my local interest is in sports. I have my own sports radio show at KWAI AM 1080 that you can stream live. I also have my own website, pjsportsradio.com. We have live guests in studio, and we talk about discussions and topics that everyone wants to know locally here on the islands. We cover everything from surfing to basketball to whatever's going on locally, sports-wise. We try to do our best and cover the topics in depth as much as we can. Once again, thank you for joining PJ here on Hawaii Sports Update. Mahalo. Welcome back to Think Tech Asia. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Uh, we, our guest today is Mr. Richard Hornick. We've been talking about Hong Kong, and of course we've been talking about the Umbrella Movement, but also other aspects of uh, contemporary Hong Kong society. Um, 
Yeah, as we were talking about during the break, it seems like you never hear about the term the dragons mm -hmm. anymore. Uh, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore. And um, it seems they all have fairly similar problems, the hollowing out of the middle class. Uh, the middle class and all those places seems to feel pretty squeezed, mm -hmm. especially through the high housing prices, uh, hard to get ahead. Um, what, what's, what's Hong Kong's economic future as you see it? Well, you know, part of the problem is that they're all victims of their own success. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to grow when you have a, a per capita GDP of $100 a year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you get up to ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a year, getting those same sort of levels of increase become more and more difficult. And many of them, you know, benefited from the rising tide of the global economy. Um, but, you know, I think South, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore are all on, on fairly firm uh, footing. Taiwan may be a little less so because they, they are so heavily dependent on, on China. Uh, but, you know, I think those three are doing pretty well. Hong Kong is uh, in a slightly more, well, in a much more difficult situation. Hong Kong made, as you said before, Hong Kong is a creation of China trade. Mm -hmm. it, and we, they, they had the key, you know, for, from 1974 until 1994 four or so, 20 years maybe, maybe a little longer, you didn't get into Hong, uh, China unless you went through Hong Kong or maybe Taiwan. But by and large, everybody used uh, Hong Kong middlemen. A lot of the investment, foreign investment in, in South, in, in Shenzhen in that area, was all done by Hong Kong uh, entrepreneurs. So they really made their, their money that way. Right. And now, you don't have to go through Hong Kong anymore. Um, you know, you can just fly right into Wuhan. You can, you know, forget about Shanghai and right, Beijing. You right. can go to Chengdu. You can, be, you know, as a foreign businessman, you can source wherever you want to go. Mm. So Hong Kong is no longer has no longer has this this lock this this uh, this hold on that business. So it uh, it's, you know, they, they they I don't want to overstate this, but they were sort of rent collectors for a long time. They took they you know there was a toll. Right, right, right. And they, you know, the toll's gone. Right. So what do they do now? Uh, what, what, how do they reinvent themselves? Uh, and, you know, a lot of it, it seems to be that they're reinventing themselves as Disneyland. Uh, there is a big Disneyland there. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but, you know, 27 million mainland tourists. That, that's not a metaphor. That's reality. It's reality. <laughs> but, you know, there are a lot of things that it's, you know, that basically it's, you know, tourists coming in, uh, mainland tourists shopping, that sort of stuff. Uh, it's, again, a lot of real estate, a lot of mainlanders are, are getting their money out of the mainland because nobody's ever sure what's going to happen, and they, you know, they're dumping that into real estate in Hong Kong. Um, so it, it, there needs to be a strategic vision for the future of Hong Kong. I, I'm not a big fan of Singapore or, or the or I remember the you saying that the other day, yeah. Um, you know, but they, they have a guided democracy mm -hmm. that works that you know, produces for their people. Hong Kong has a guided democracy that doesn't work for its mm. people. Mm. Um, and maybe you know, Singapore is in a slightly better position. They have more, uh, it's smaller, they have more facilities, you know, a lot of shipping and that sort of stuff. And Hong Kong will always have some of that as well. But I just don't think that they're, uh, I think Hong Kong has been run, run primarily for the benefit of the property class. Of the, you know, the, the tycoons, ty tycoons and, and the mini tycoons, mm -hmm. but uh, it's all it's all about property. And the act, by the way, they inherited this from the British. That's right. how the British. That's where they're. You know, everybody's. Oh, there's no tax on Hong Kong. Of course, there's a tax. There's a tax in the fact that they, the government sells land, right. and that's how they get the revenue. But that also drives up the cost of doing business. So you pay a tax in the form of of higher prices for your groceries, for instance. Anyway, so. They need to think outside of the box and, um, and, and reinvent themselves as something other than an entrepot for, for China. Will the economic elite allow Hong Kong to do that? I mean, it's, it's making out on the current situation. Is it, is it willing to go along with this thinking well, outside the box? Well, that's, but that's the whole point. That's, that's the crux of the battle in Hong Kong. It's not about how the chief executive is, is elected. It's how it's who the chief exec whom the chief executive serves, mm. and you know, and the 
property classes. They all kowtow to Beijing. Right. They're on the plane up there, you know, Li Kaxing, you know, yeah. tugging his forelock, you know, every time there's any sign of danger, they all were forced to come out and denounce the umbrella protests, right. and they did so. So, no, they're not going to make those choices. They're, they're all members of the Chinese Political Consultative well, Conference yeah, I mean, and that kind yeah, of yeah, stuff. Yeah, whatever that's worth. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, no, I mean, there's a, it's, it's, you know, in any democracy, in any, you know, politi political economy, uh, the main question is uh, who whom, you know, as mm -hmm. Lenin would say, who's, whose who ox whom? is going to get? Board and um, and who's going to get taxed and whose whose profits are going to go down um, and and I you know I don't see any willingness to confront that issue uh, by the people who are making the decisions. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, the the China connection for Hong Kong is really a double-edged sword, isn't it? I mean, yeah, okay, there's a lot of economic benefits, but then there's so much hot money from China sure. flowing into Hong Kong, driving up real estate prices. Uh, uh, creating sort of friction, I mm -hmm. think, between Hong Kong Chinese and mainland Chinese. Oh, absolutely. No, I mean, I've, uh, you know, if you follow social media in Hong Kong, you can see almost every day somebody posts a photograph of some mainland tourist doing something obscene or, mm. you know, ugly or whatever. Um, yeah, no, those tensions are there. But, you know, that's, there's nothing they can do about it. Right. I mean, that's where they are. So they need to figure out. Uh, I, I, I mentioned this the other day. I, I, a dozen years ago, I wrote an article for, for Fortune entitled, mm -hmm. Who Needs Con Hong Kong? You know, mm -hmm. 12 years ago, people were talking about this. Right. And I said at the end, you know, if they got it figured out, you know, they're never going to be the New York of Asia, which is what they, you know, their slogans, or Asia's world city. Right. But, you know, they could be like the Chicago of China. Right. You know, they could be, you know, something really important. Mm. Los Angeles of China, whatever. Right. right. And if they don't get it figured out, think Cleveland. Right. And, you know, like, it looks, you know, to me, you know, Cleveland might be uh, about where they're headed, if that. Mm. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's very, you talk to my, I, you talk to your friends, I talk to my friends, and nobody there sees this ending well. Mm. The amount of influence exerted by Beijing on Hong Kong, how does that compare to the amount of influence that was uh, exerted by London? I, I have this impression that China, despite the fact they like to say, well, we have, you know, autonomous regions mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. all that, a lot of these Chinese autonomous regions sure. are under yeah. tighter control of Beijing than just right. regular provinces. The regular provinces seem to have more good, That's leeway. a good question. Uh, you know, well, but as you also know, in China, the old line, you know, the mountains are high and the emperor is far away. Yeah, so, that's true. Uh, yeah, yeah. you know, I remember traveling around Guangdong province in, in the 80s, and there were all these companies that had you know, 100 employees, 1,000 employees, and I go to the local party guy and I say, you know, that's against the law in your country. You can't have more than four. You know, he said, well, that's, that's Beijing's rule. But, you know, <laughs> things are going well here, so they'd leave us alone. Right. And I think, to a certain degree, that's what you have in Hong Kong. Mm. That, um, that Beijing would just as soon not have to worry about it. Uh, and I do think that they've been given a lot of autonomy. Um, I do think that they have mm, misused that autonomy. Point. Um, that they have, um, again, tried, you know, were sort of guilty of preemptive sycophancy, trying to anticipate what Beijing wanted. Right. Well, really what Beijing wants is, is for the damn place to be successful and quiet. Okay. That's, you know, and so I, you know, I think the British had a much more, um, in many ways, uh, for a, certainly for a long, long time, much more direct role in, in running Hong Kong. I do think now, in the wake of the Umbrella Revolution and all of the, the mishaps that they've had for the last year, that Beijing is now much more in charge. Mm, interesting. Um, um, you, you, uh, this question came up at the China Seminar the other day. Uh, I, I remember a lady asked it. We said, and, and let me see if I can capture what the essence of the question was, well, doesn't the Chinese government really want to build up Shanghai to a point that it reduces the relative importance of Hong Kong. Isn't that their preference? Aren't they more comfortable having Shanghai as an economic center than Hong Kong? Sure. I mean, uh, for national pride purposes and everything else, but if you look at what Beijing has given Hong Kong since 1997, they've been given all sorts of special treatment economically. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody has been saying this from the beginning, oh, they, you know, they want Shanghai to, to overtake Hong Kong. 
if they want Shanghai to overtake Hong Kong, they, they have to do one thing that they're not ready to do, which is make the renminbi a freely convertible currency. Mm -hmm. and, and also do something the Japanese never did, which is to make it a world reserve currency. Just, just so we, we're, we're sure we understand you here, why wouldn't they want to do that? Why wouldn't they want to make the renminbi a fully convertible? It's still a very, um, in many ways, fragile developing country. Okay. You have to give up, you know, what's the one thing that authoritarians don't like to do? They don't give like to control. give up control. <laughs> and if you make it freely you know, tra a convertible currency, and especially if you make it a reserve currency, there's nothing you can do, mm. right? I mean, look at the euro. Right. Um, Good point. You know, it's so, um, yeah, no, it's a long way away. And that's, and, and Hong Kong will benefit from that. But, you know, there's, there's a possibility that uh, other places will benefit as well. Mm. You know, when I look at, uh, let's talk about, we're coming down on the last four minutes here, but let's just say a word or two about Macau. Uh, as I look at Macau, as I look at Hong Kong, you can say, well, the British certainly did some good things in mm -hmm. Hong Kong during their, what is 150 years of mm -hmm. colonial control. If I look at Macau with its 450 years of Portuguese control, it seems to me they did very, very little. Um, and I, I'm not a real big fan on gambling casinos, but I, it seems to me that that they, they pump some energy, some life mm -hmm. into Macau. Of course, they're being somewhat set back now as they, yeah. um, <laughs> Beijing having figured out that's what a lot of people go to launder money and. Yeah, well, basically there's less lo money to launder, I think, the corruption and the crackdown has uh, yeah. been. Well, look, um, you know, the Portuguese were never known as great colonial masters and mm. do a great job in Angola or Goa or any of those <laughs> other places. So Timor is really uh, pretty sad. Timor. So why would you know, Macau have been, it was a very sort of laissez-faire place. I, I used to love going there, mm -hmm. uh, just and not to gamble, just because it was kind of the shabby old Southeast Asian place, you know, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. all gone now. They've pretty much erased all that. Right. And so the charm is missing. Um, you know, it was always a big uh, gambling center that was, you know, Stanley Ho, the, right, the, the right. Macau. With the, the, he had the, the death grip yeah, on, the, right. on the gambling yeah, empire there. So, um, and that ended uh, not under the Portuguese, but under the Chinese. Right. Um, so, um, you know, it's it's a tiny little place. It's just uh, it's not it, it's never had the importance that Hong Kong has as right. a trading or financial center. Um, it, it seems to me that some people might argue that uh, Hong Kong's reversion of China was is sort of a mixed bag. But it seems to me in Macau's case, its reversion of China was probably a positive. Hard to tell very hard to tell but it, because it has been turned into Disneyland mm -hmm. I mean there's absolutely nothing going on it's been turned into Las Vegas right right uh, and I would say it's even more it's probably even more heavily dependent on gambling than Las Vegas is uh, I point. think that's probably true um, that's the only thing they've got that's going. all well, some manufacturing right. Right. very little very mm -hmm. little because why would you I mean there's no real estate is too damn expensive to right. manufacture you can go across the border to Juhai right, you know, right, right. And even Juhai is too expensive Right, right, right. Um, a couple of minutes left here. What's your, how about the people that get elected to LegCo? What, how, how would you characterize them? Are they competent people? Or are they? It, it varies. I mean, I think the ones who are, are elected by the, the people through constituencies, through geographic constituencies, tend to be pretty good. Mm -hmm. By the way, um, one of the things people aren't focusing on is that there are enough people in LegCo to defeat the new election law that you know, Beijing has pushed through. Wow. So they need more than 60% of the vote, uh, or two-thirds of the vote. And so they may not get that. So there may not be a new election law at all. Wow. So 2017 could come along, and uh, who knows what will happen. Well, uh, you really gave us a lot to think about today. You're, obviously, your experience with Hong Kong is deep, and uh, I'd like to thank you for joining us today, and thank you for uh, being here. And uh, this is Bill Sharp, host of Think Tech Asia, and we'll see you here next week. Aloha.